Death has come to your little town, Sheriff. So we meet this kid, Michael Myers, whose sister sucks at babysitting because this six-year-old is just standing outside by himself on Halloween night. He looks in the window and sees his sister and her boyfriend going up to her bedroom. So Michael goes in the back door, into the kitchen, grabs a knife, and when he turns the corner, he sees the boyfriend already coming down the stairs. I mean, talk about a two-pump chump. I mean, there's no way that I could even got my pants off in that amount of time, let alone finish the job. So you know she didn't get any satisfaction out of that, and there definitely wasn't any foreplay involved. Anyway, Michael grabs his mask, puts it on, then goes up to his sister's room, where he stabs her to death. Michael! So now, in the past 60 seconds, she's had two different guys come into her room, penetrate her, and leave. This has not been my night. He then walks outside to see his parents pull up, and they see the six-year-old, dressed like a clown, holding a bloody knife, and are just like, Now, Michael, we have to talk about you stabbing your sister. I think it's cute. So it's now 15 years later, and we see this doctor and nurse driving through the rain. But as they pull up to the hospital, they see a bunch of the patients outside grazing like cattle. Michael's around someplace. While Dr. Loomis goes to try to call the hospital, one of the patients jumps on top of the car, and this nurse Marion's like, oh, I wonder what that was, and stupidly rolls down the window to see what it was. But then the patient attacks her and steals the car. God's sakes, he can't drive a car. Maybe someone around here gave him lessons. The next day, we meet this girl, Lori Strode, whose dad wants her to drop off some keys at a real estate property for him. On the way there, she bumps into Tommy, the little kid she's supposed to babysit tonight, and he points out that the house she's dropping the keys off to is Michael's old house. Does anybody live here? No, not since 1963 when it happened. Every kid in Haddonfield thinks this place is haunted. Well, it turns out, Michael was the escape patient last night, and he's in the house. He overhears Tommy and Lori talking about how she's babysitting him tonight. <laughs> hey, babysitter! And because he hates babysitters, he's gonna stalk her. Oh, is this another love story? No, this is like a scary stalking. Like, he's crazy and he wants to kill her. Then why didn't he kill her when she was at the door? I don't know. He attacked the nurse without a weapon. Anyway, he watches her walk away and just breathes really heavy. Well, Dr. Loomis is really upset that they let Michael escape, and he thinks that he's heading back to Haddonfield. Because I know him. He hasn't spoken a word in 15 years. In class, Lori looks outside and sees a guy in a William Shatner mask staring at her. <laughs> hey, babysitter! And after school, Tommy gets picked on by the only kids in school that don't celebrate Halloween. They tell him that the boogeyman's gonna get him. Well, the bullies make him break his pumpkin, so we feel sorry for him, and Michael saw the whole thing and decides to follow Tommy. Oh, subtle, isn't he? Well, Dr. Loomis randomly pulls over to call the sheriff's department to let him know that Michael might be popping up in Haddonfield. And this also happens to be right next to a truck that Michael ran off the road, killed the driver, and stole his clothes. So he pulled over because he saw the truck? No, he finds it after the phone call. And he knows that Michael did this, not because of the hospital gown that's in a bush, but because of the strip club matchbook he saw Marion using last night. And he's so motivated to find Michael that he doesn't even care what happened to the driver. I told everybody! Nobody listened. We then go back to Lori, who's walking with her friend Linda, who's complaining about how busy her social life is, as she's hanging out with her friend instead of going to cheerleading practice. You can either ignore it, or you can help me to stop it. And then their friend Annie runs over and complains about how her boyfriend got grounded and can't hang out with her later. See, Linda and her boyfriend were supposed to meet up with Annie and her boyfriend while Annie was babysitting. And Lori's just going to be across the street. Terrific. I've got three choices. Watch the kids sleep, listen to Linda screw around, or talk to you. And after they say goodbye to Linda, Michael pops out of a bush. <laughs> hey, babysitter! But Annie doesn't see him. And after Annie gets home, she bumps into Annie's dad, who's a sheriff. <laughs> and she stupidly doesn't tell him that there's a guy in a Captain Kirk mask hiding behind a bush in the neighbor's yard. Why? Because that's his job. What? And when she gets home, she goes to close a window and sees Michael outside standing by her laundry. <laughs> hey, babysitter! But the wind blows, and he disappears like a magician dressed up like TJ Hooker. And then her phone rings, and she hears chewing on the other end, because Annie can't talk with her mouth full. But she calls back to say that she'll pick her up at 6.30. But Tommy lives close enough that she was walking him to school. Why does she need a ride? I didn't know you thought about things like that, Lori. Shut up. They're teenagers. They drive just because they can. So, for some stupid reason, Dr. Loomis decides to go see Judith Meyer's grave. And when they get there, they realize that the tombstone's been taken. Why do they do it? Goddamn kids. We get candy. So the girls are still driving around, and they've smoked so much weed at this point that they don't even notice Michael following them around. 
but then Annie sees her dad outside of the hardware store and decides to pull over to talk to him. Well, apparently somebody broke into the open hardware store and stole a mask, some rope, and some knives. So we're supposed to think it's Michael, but he had the mask way earlier when she was in school. I don't know. Maybe they suck at their jobs and it took them nine hours to respond to the call. I mean, we are talking about a sheriff who can't smell the weed in his daughter's car. I think he knew. I'm sure he could smell it. Could have been a skunk. But then Dr. Loomis shows up to talk to Sheriff Brackett, and while he's waiting on him, misses his own car drive by. So apparently the girls keep driving around for a few more hours until it gets dark. They then go to their respected kids' houses to babysit the only kids in town that don't trick or treat. Don't you know what happens on Halloween? Leave me alone! So Sheriff Brackett and Dr. Loomis get to the Myers house, where they discover a dead dog that either Michael or a skunk ate. He got hungry. Could have been a skunk. Could have. A skunk? Yeah, apparently skunks break into houses, lure dogs in, and then eat them. It's very common in the Midwest. Yeah, you know, you know, every town is something like this happens. But where'd he go? Did the crabs carry him away? I swear to God. Well, Dr. Loomis wants to stay around and see if Michael shows up, but he tells Sheriff Brackett not to let anyone in town know that there's an escaped lunatic on the loose. Seems to me you're just plain scared. Yes. So the dog at Annie's house is going nuts, and when Tommy looks out the window, we can see that the dog's going crazy because Michael's in their yard. He tells Lori, and despite the fact that she thinks someone has been following her around all day, she blows him off because Annie told a boy she likes him. But then Annie spills a small dab of butter on her shirt, so she has to strip and go do laundry. Let me see breasts. I want to see Jamie Lee's breasts. When do yes. we see Jamie yes. Lee's breasts? Well, the dog goes after Michael, and apparently he gets hungry again. So Annie locks herself in the laundry house and then gets stuck in a window. But this whole time, Michael's outside and doesn't do anything because apparently it's not dramatic enough. What are you waiting for, huh? Annie's boyfriend calls, and since Paul's parents are gone for the night, he's able to sneak out. So she drops Lindsay off at Tommy's house. And in exchange for this, Annie's going to tell the boy that Lori likes, who agreed to go out with her on a date tomorrow night, that Lori actually doesn't like him if she watches the kid. What? Seriously, don't try to understand it. Teenagers are stupid. I always forget my chemistry book and my math book and my English book and my... The only thing that ever bothers me is their gibberish. When they start raving on and on. It doesn't really matter if you have your books or not. Yeah, I think I got it. So Annie goes to her car, where she realizes she doesn't have her keys. So she goes inside, gets the keys, and when she comes back, doesn't realize that the car's unlocked. Well, Michael's inside, and he attacks her. And she dies. Paul, is this one of your cheap trips? Well, Tommy sees him carrying Annie inside the house, and he reacts in a way that Lindsay will never find him attractive ever in the future. So the sheriff checks in on Loomis and tells him that he kind of wants to go home, but if he really thinks that there's a psycho on the loose, that he'll do his job. You little shit stick Mayberry ass reject. So Linda and Bob show up to Lindsay's house and think that no one's home. So they decide to go upstairs where there's a lit jack-o'-lantern next to the bed, just in case we forgot it was Halloween. And after this teenage boy overcomes erectile dysfunction, can't help it, the phone keeps ringing. He gives Linda the best 30 seconds of her life. Want a beer? I'll be right back. Never, ever, ever under any circumstances say, I'll be right back, because you won't be back. And then Bob goes downstairs to steal some beers from Lindsay's parents, and Michael doesn't like this, so he stabs Bob, and he dies. And it might seem that Bob wanted to die because he doesn't put up much of a fight. Well, Michael pins him to the wall, and it looks like he grabbed the biggest, longest, sharpest knife that the hardware store had to offer because it not only goes through Bob, but also the door with plenty of room to spare. He then dresses up like a ghost to go kill Linda, but I'm not sure why. I mean, he's already dressed up like Johnny Moon. Well, Linda calls Lori, and while she's being killed, it kind of sounds like she's into it. <laughs> Don't rip my blouse, it's expensive, idiot. So after several hours of standing by a bush, Dr. Loomis finally turns around and sees his car parked across the street. Hey, now that's wonderful. <laughs> well, since the kids are asleep, Lori decides to go across the street where she thinks all of her friends are all... Everybody's having a good time tonight. When she can't get in the front door, she walks around the back, where apparently a skunk dragged it off the dog's dead body, and when she goes in the back door, either Bob didn't bleed when he got stabbed, or Michael mopped it up. She looks around for him downstairs, and when she doesn't find him, even though she thinks they might all be naked, she goes upstairs to check the bedrooms. You're not supposed to go up there. Yes, I am. Well, she finds Annie posed with his sister's tombstone. Annie? Was that you? 
And then he rigged Bob's body to swing from the ceiling. Bob? And made a door open to reveal Linda stuffed in a closet. Linda? I mean, are we supposed to believe that Michael's like under the bed pulling some strings or something? I'm not really sure how all this works. I mean, what if she didn't even come over? And after she realizes that all of her friends are dead, she doesn't try to call the cops or run away. She just stops and cries for a little bit. <laughs> hey, babysitter! And then she gets stabbed, falls down some stairs, and forgets how doors work. But then she realizes that glass breaks and escapes to go find some help. The old Girl Scout comes through again. But let me tell you this, she does not have very friendly neighbors. So she goes back to Tommy's place where she locked herself out. And Tommy senses her urgency and rushes to the front door to let her in. She locks the door behind her, but Michael climbed in a window without her noticing. But not before he cut the phone line. So Lori knows he's in the house because she can hear him breathing. But I have two questions. One, how did he manage to cut the phone line and get in the house when he's walking this slow? And two, the window that he supposedly came in is right next to the phone that she was just using. So... How did he pull that off? Oh, shut up, jerk. So who cares? All right, you guys, what's next? So he pops up and tries to stab her, but she stabs him first with her knitting needles. Like a, like a grandmother? Well, she's pretty sure he's dead, so she goes upstairs to check the kids instead of trying another phone. But then the kids see him behind her, and they separate because they think that he only wants to kill her. So she hides in a closet, thinking that the solid structure of the door will protect her. You guys think I'm too smart. But he breaks in, and she stabs him with a coat hanger, which makes him drop the knife. Then she picks up the knife and stabs him with it. Then she sneaks past him to go check on the kids. She tells him to go next door and try to call the cops, but we've seen how that's worked. But she stays behind for staying in danger reasons, and Michael sits back up. <laughs> hey, babysitter! Well, luckily, the kids run out screaming, so Loomis knows where they came from. And he runs into the house and stops Michael from attacking her. He shoots him a couple times, and he falls off the balcony. But when Loomis looks over the rail... Michael's gone. You mean he just disappeared? Where'd he go? I don't know. Probably one of those skunks dragged him off. As a matter of fact, it was. You know, it's Halloween. Everybody should hit the subscribe button. Totally. Oh, 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 I can no longer stop. He's gone. He's gone from here. The evil is gone. And the book 